more than 75% of the Earth's land area is already degraded according to the European Commission World Atlas of Desertification, and more than 90% could become degraded by 2050. What does climate change have to do with desertification? Both looking at me, I have no choice. <laughs> um, um, uh, climate change is uh, that and human encroachment and in intentional deforestation, like what Bolsonaro is doing in the Amazon, and he's continuing and accelerating a trend that had already been in place before he took power, but chopping down rainforest as fast as possible or intentionally burning it to uh, make way for uh, cattle pasture, for beef, for American and EU markets. Um, so human encroachment, but certainly um, with the climate crisis, when you increase atmospheric temperature, it is going to draw more moisture out of the ground and trees and vegetation. And then um, that a warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture until at which we have these amazing uh, extreme weather events, these huge floods that then functionally wipe away arable land, crops. We see this happening in Central America already. That's a big part of the refugee crisis uh, causing the crisis at our border of people, farmers that literally aren't making it down there. And this has been going on for years and it's going to get worse to the point where certainly well before 2100, if you look at projections, it will be impossible to grow food there. So where do those people go? Um, that's some of the way that the climate is impacting it. So, you know, huge increasing droughts of severity, length, and frequency everywhere. This is happening right here in our Midwest as well, followed then by uh, extreme flooding events like last spring. Um, we have farmer suicides hitting record levels. This can't continue. That kind of thing's been besetting India for quite a few years now and other places around the globe too. So I, that's going to be another huge impact and factor into to food prices. I'm ever the journalist, so I like to ask questions as well as answer them. And Stephen, you were talking about our problem with soil, and obviously that relates to farming. Are we going to be in a position at some point where we don't have enough to eat and we can't feed our own peoples in America? Well, you know, it's interesting. The, I mentioned that in terms of global warming, many, many experts have for years been recognizing that we need to be shifting away from industrial production to what they call agroecological, which uh, are organic or near organic, but there are practices that are much more in harmony with, uh, with nature and uh, actually produce greater f nutrient den density, but they build up the soil too instead of depleting the soil. So that certainly would be one of the uh, ways to start uh, guarding against and even reversing this process of desertification by building up the organic matter in the soil and creating healthy soil, which we need to do because our good soils have been eroding at an alarming rate. Now, of course, the proponents of, uh, of industrial agriculture, who are also the same people who often tell us we don't have to worry about global warming and we can just keep going on the way we're going on and uh, you know, burning uh, energy right and left and, and uh, drilling for oil and mining for coal, coal and burning that without, and lessening the restrictions on it instead of strengthening them. They also say that organic can't feed the world. And they keep making these claims as if they're, they've got the evidence behind them. And actually, the evidence is the other way. Uh, the evidence is actually demonstrating, to the extent we have it, and we have a lot, that actually organic has the potential to feed the world. And uh, it can do a lot better job of it, and it will make a far healthier and better world. Just cite you a few examples, because this is certainly something that we have to do it's going to be a major component of making the world cooler and more livable in almost every respect and creating more food and also very importantly creating it where it's needed in the developing world. Here in the developed world we really have surpluses 
and uh, and experts. In fact, the in 28, I'm sorry, 2008, a study was published that had been sponsored by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, hardly radical organizations, and uh, it was. Uh, it was conducted, it was a four-year study. It was called the International Assessment of Agricultural Knowledge and Technology, Science and Technology for Development. Um, it was conducted by more than 400 experts from 80 countries. 58 governments have by now endorsed it. And uh, first it stated genetic engineering doesn't really have a significant role to play in meeting the world's food needs. Now that flies in the face of the claims of the proponents that we need genetic engineering uh, to, uh, to meet the world's uh, nutritional needs. It also stated we don't need industrial agriculture, especially in the developing world where it is not well suited and uh, it's just going to increase the problems. What it did say is, as I've mentioned before, it emphasized agroecological techniques and it said that's what can actually create yields, and that wasn't just theoretical. Um, the, uh, there's been, there have been extensive studies. Um, let me give you a few examples. A recent United Nations report surveyed 114 farming projects in 24 African countries, and it determined that through the adoption of organic or near-organic practices, Yields increased on average by over 100%. That means they more than doubled. Uh, further evidencing the widespread success of such methods in Africa, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food reported, quote, yields went up 214% in 44 projects in 20 countries in sub-Saharan Africa using agroecological farming techniques over a period of three to 10 years. And he pointed out that this accomplishment is, quote, far more than any GM crop has ever done. It's also been for more than any probably industrial, high, high input industrial has done in those areas as well. And he stated, we need these methods if we're going to meet the world's food needs. So, and also, as I mentioned, by meeting the f world's food needs in the most economical, these methods are cheaper. They don't require as many inputs. They're suited to, uh, to uh, subsist to small-scale farming. They create greater nutrient density per acre. And at the same time, as I said, they, re they are burning less fossil fuel and consuming less fossil fuel in the, uh, because they're not using the fertilizers and pesticides that uh, rely on fossil fuels for their manufacture but they also are sequestering more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as they build up healthy soil, which then sequesters more. And so um, really, it's a win-win-win situation, and it can be one of the greatest techniques to uh, help stop and then reverse global warming. So uh, it's very, very important that people understand the importance of stopping genetic engineering, uh, you know, calling out the lies that it's needed to increase production because in many, uh, there are many studies to show that it has decreased production uh, and in several instances, and that we don't need industrial monocropping. What we need is polycropping and agroecological techniques.